So hello, East Brunswick. I'm here today with the New Jersey Assembly Minority Leader, John Bramnick. And we're here to discuss, as um, I've done in the past, issues that are related to those of us that live here in East Brunswick and to see where our representatives are on many of the issues that are matter most importantly to us. So I'm going to start uh, uh, right away and with uh, first uh, Happy Halloween. Same you, Mayor. Is that your costume? Uh, it's a little scary. I dressed down uh, today because Halloween, this is about as dressed down as I get. Oh, okay. So uh, maybe before we get into any actual topic, you talk a little bit about yourself, where you're from, and, um, and how you got to where you are right now. Yeah, I'm from Plainfield originally. I live in Westfield. Mm -hmm. I got an assembly in 2003. It's now 2018. In 2012, I became the assembly minority leader. And I've served in that position now for about six years, that, that the minority is the Republicans, if you don't know. And really? the majority is the Democrats. You probably know that I in know. East Brunswick. Well, it's, a, it's actually, a, as, as towns go, we're pretty open. And most people are, are undecided or undeclared. So uh, I think uh, I could vouch for most people that they go with the person they believe is best for the job. That's why every, everyone should do that. I'm a trial lawyer in my other life. And I do stand-up comedy. I've done that for 30 years. Great. So when you're retired, do you have another career? Exactly. I think I'll go with stand-up comedy. <laughs> I, got, I got plenty of material from Trenton. <laughs> so very good. Um, maybe a little bit about what it actually means to be a the minority leader. What is that role? Just so that people have a sense of what that means. So my caucus there's 26 members. The minority leader tries uh, to work with its their caucus, and Craig Coughlin is the speaker on the Democratic side. He technically is the leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and as the leader of the Republicans in the caucus, I try to bring consensus to my members, try to come out with some policy, try to many times vote as a unit if we can. Mm -hmm. And I go to the Democrats, the majority side, I and mean, sometimes you can work out things procedurally. And I try to really set policy within the caucus. Good. So that's a, a, a true politician. You have to kind of get everybody on one page. Well, that's what I would hope politicians <laughs> do today. That's what they I don't do. see much of that. My first bill or my first resolution in the legislature in 2003, which is timely now, was to increase civility in New Jersey. And I thought back in 2003 things were bad. And now I think they're terrible in terms of relationships, what, what appears to be relationships between politicians. And so that's something I've been strongly in favor of for a long time. Yeah, I don't really think that the social media has helped in that regard. I think it's it, actually it, well, polarized it's us even more. And also, the cable TV shows, you've got MSNBC versus Fox, right? They never really compliment the other side. And they stay in their lanes, which is not good. And on social media, with all due respect to people, they lash out, especially crazy people. And it gives them a forum where they can say crazy things. The, the person in the middle of the road, the reasonable person, they're not on social media. And now we don't have very much in the news organizations of kind of the middle because the middle doesn't sell. No one wants to watch some boring show about policy. They'll switch to the side which is making allegations against the other side. Yeah, and I, I think unfortunately we've seen the result of that just this past weekend where uh, the you know, 11 innocent lives were taken in a house of worship where you should never we should be able to go there and not have to worry about your safety at all ever yeah that's it's really reached the point where people who are fragile and you're a doctor you're probably better explaining this than I am but there are people who are so fragile that they believe that some of the rhetoric that occurs out there uh, is is enough to send them over the top I just did a speech on the floor in the legislature that whether it's Governor Murphy or President Trump, they, could br they should bring in their, their biggest adversary, the person who disagrees them the most, sit and do a round table. If President Trump can go to North Korea, or should I say talk to the president of North Korea, then I'm sure all leading politicians can talk to opponents and show that we differ on policy, but we don't hate each other. Yeah. And, and I think we're in a really dangerous time. And I mean, it almost takes me back to uh, growing up, and my brother and I would argue, and then we would be at each other's throats. And my mother just said, 
go up to your room, you can't come out until you, the problem is solved. The only rules are you can't kill each other and you can't destroy anything. But don't come out, you don't get dinner, you don't eat, you don't go past go, don't collect $200 until you finish resolving your problems. I don't care how you do it. My mother used to say, wait until your father gets home. <laughs> and we'd be in our rooms, and then you hear your father. And he was tired from work. He would come up those stairs. She was, was probably different. she was probably the stronger one. It was just that fear that that got you to the to the he did bargaining not table. You want to get him mad, so <laughs> I would I'd be in there. I said I didn't say anything. <laughs> Perhaps we could talk a little bit about um, one of the issues right now that I know is very important to you, and uh, is relevant to to many people in the state and particularly here in East Brunswick, and that is the issue of affordable housing and the requirements uh, that were part of that third round. Um, in the Cliff Notes kind of fashion, could you talk mm. to residents a little bit about what COA means and, and where and why we're at the point we're at right now? Of course, COA doesn't exist right now, but in a nutshell, the courts 30 years ago said uh, you cannot have zoning that would exclude multiple family housing. What they really said was you can't exclude less expensive homes uh, in your community by having zoning of an acre or two acres or 10 acres. The court was saying because it doesn't provide enough housing for people who can't afford this expensive, let's say, home. So over the last 30 years, it evolved where the legislature has tried to comply with the court by trying to impose I'll call affordable housing or less expensive housing on communities. Right, and just so everybody yeah. knows, affordable housing, when we say that, is not Section 8, it's not welfare, it's not... It, well, it's, it's, some of it is. I mean, some of it, when a builder comes in, and let's assume you're going to build 200 units in East Brunswick, there are some requirements now, uh, especially if, it's, if the 200 units were uh, built because of a lawsuit, a certain percentage of those have to be affordable. Correct. Meaning that, let's say, 10% have to be way below market. But here's where it's left. The legislature, with all due respect to my friends across the aisle, uh, have decided not to do anything. In the last few years, there is no legislation that is trying to fix the affordable housing crisis. So what's happening is the courts now are in charge, meaning the Supreme Court says you better change the law. The legislature now not addressing it so the courts say okay there's a lawsuit you have to put in 250 units you have to put in 500 units you have to put a thousand units what has to be done is the legislature has to take this from the courts and set up a policy that's reasonable for all communities set it up by north jersey south jersey central jersey mm -hmm. say okay we need 40,000 units shouldn't be all in one town obviously but there are places where you can build it which doesn't need new infrastructure has transportation. Right now, it's the Wild West in the courts. And that's why people, towns are spending a lot of money. It's really expensive. The legislature must re reel this back in and set policy. So um, in many instances, there's communities that because the courts have taken on that responsibility and had deadlines for settlements, there's many towns, uh, ours included, who have settled. And as a result, uh, zoning changes had to be done as part of that settlement, and they were done. And, um, and only now are some of the developers coming in and um, putting in applications, whether they be to zoning boards or planning boards, depends on the, the application, and whether or not there needs to be any uh, uh, variances that will determine which board it goes to. But at the end of the day, once it goes into any one of these boards, there's a time frame that uh, the town has to give an answer on any of those applications. So while um, the legislature, and I agree, need to take some sort of, of uh, responsibility and try to control this, uh, the applications are still proceeding. So what can we do, well, or the legislator do, to well, help us while you're solving the problem? Because once these buildings start going up and uh, you can't take it back, well, I don't know the specific situation in East Brunswick. Normally what happens, fair housing advocates bring a lawsuit. The court then settles that case. Normally if it's settled and the town agrees to a certain number of units, mm -hmm. that will then put an end in the short term 
to a developer coming in and rezoning property because that settlement by the court normally will prohibit further use of the so-called Mount Laurel Doctrine, meaning that if this town has said, uh, we build 300 units pursuant to the lawsuit, and then a developer comes in and says, I want to change that two-acre property into multiple family housing, at that point, you've already settled your lawsuit. That's normally immunity against the subsequent developer's application. Right. I guess the question is there's many settlements that have been done that were done at basically a gun-to-the-head type of deadline, and zoning changes were done, settlements were then made, towns agreed to something that they ordinarily would never have agreed to only because of a gun to the head with a deadline to settle. Right. So some of those decisions were not made in the best interest of the town, uh, but they're settlements. And so these the are previous decisions? Decisions words, made by the, by the court-imposed deadline. Okay. How do we legislate something that puts those on hold while you're resolving okay. the issue of affordable housing? Well, let me first say, if there's been a settlement with the courts, uh, the only way to do that is for the legislature to impose a moratorium. We have a bill which imposes a moratorium until the legislature actually implements new policy. And is that something that has bipartisan support? No. Okay. Uh, it's a Republican bill. Uh, and let, let's, I'm going to be honest with you as to the politics here. Generally, and this is after my 15 years in the legislature, the Democrats are in favor of uh, court-imposed housing. Uh, and let me just say why. They, they have a strong belief that this affordable housing is needed. I also think there's some politics involved as well. And at this point, the Democratic majority is not making any move towards changing the situation where the courts are in charge. So, I guess the question comes and, down And I don't to mean to be partisan, but that's, that's no, I guess those what, are the votes. Yeah, I guess the... I don't think that many people innately question the fact that New Jersey is an incredibly difficult state to afford. Uh, housing's very expensive, and, and many people are leaving the state uh, because it's so expensive to live here, housing being only one part of the expense of living here. Um, so I don't know if, if uh, by and large, most people innately don't get the fact that we need to provide something that allows starting teachers and starting uh, cops and people who Wait, are let like the a, legislature do it that's all it, it it just there needs to be a better way of doing it um, that doesn't bring upon towns changes to its master plans that aren't in the town's best interest and how can we in both parties um, and is there any type of legislation going on right now to try to not make it um, a uh, party issue, but actually solve a problem? Unfortunately, it is a party issue. And I don't say this about all topics in New Jersey. You can call up uh, the majority office and ask them what legislation do they have to end this court-imposed housing. It, this is the one area where it's been very partisan. Uh, we used to have regional contribution agreements where you could transfer some of your housing requirements to an urban center where they need rehab, where they have infrastructure, where they need the money. And Joe Roberts, who was the speaker, ended regional contribution agreements. It was great for the urban centers. It was good for the suburban areas. It was great for the people who uh, wanted affordable housing. That was ended. Look, as I say, I'm not that partisan a person, either as the Republican leader or as a human being, mm -hmm. but this one area, people have to reach out to my friends on the Democratic side and say, the court should not be in charge. Whatever the solution is, let's see the legislation. Yeah, I think that... I can't get it posted. Day, I can't get my stuff posted. Yeah, That's I it. think we need to just, uh, you know, sometimes sit back, take a deep breath, and, and, and really solve the problems that are facing towns and not worry about what party well, it comes I, from. And I don't want to worry about it. I don't care what party sure. you are. This one happens to fall along party lines. You know, not everything does. What is, um, can you explain to, to residents, uh, a builder's remedy? Sure. Well, when Mount Laurel was decided, it basically said, the Supreme Court said, you know, if you have restrictive zoning and you don't provide some affordable housing, meaning an area where you get multiple family housing, and the legislature doesn't do anything, a builder could come in and say to East Brunswick, change your zoning here because you have no affordable housing. And the planning board would say, no, it's not our master plan. No, we're not going to change anything. 
They go to the courts and say, East Brunswick doesn't have affordable housing. Uh, and the Supreme Court in Mount Laurel said, you have to have it. So the su superior courts could then change your zoning laws because you didn't do anything to solve your house, affordable housing pro so problem. So it is possible that as a town wrestles through this, that if a builder gets impatient, um, they could just come in and impose a builder's remedy and it takes it out of the hands of the, res of Depending, the governing body. Uh, absolutely. Depending on what settlements you have in the past and the terms of those settlements. Mm -hmm. If the court had previously entered into a settlement that provided affordable housing, but also included a bar against further uh, builders' remedies, you could use that court decision to say, look, we went to, they went to court. We did affordable housing. Here is the order of the judge saying no more builders' remedy. Right. I just wanted residents to understand that, that, that in the uh, greater scheme of things, what possibilities are out there because it's easy to say um, that you are or are not for a particular application, uh, but it's sometimes right, it's out of the hands you. of right. the You can deny it, they'll go to court, and the court would say, you know, based on Mount Laurel decision, you don't have enough affordable housing, build more. Right. Yeah, and these are the issues that as uh, individuals responsible to the public, you know, to the residents who have elected us, these are the issues that we're facing day in and day out. And, and it's hard to say, it's not my, I don't have power to do it because you're the mayor or the council. You don't. The court is going to impose what they're going to impose based on the Supreme Court decisions. Yeah, and, and, and I think at the end of the day, what we want is just fairness. And, and I think even the residents understand that. I think the legislators understand that. I believe in my heart that the courts understand that. It's just getting everybody together on one page seems to be the, the part that um, is so difficult and, and really yeah. shouldn't be. Maybe they should go up into my old house and have everybody just sit in one room and just not come out and get dinner until it's all done. Well, if you listen to the, how, the hearings uh, in Trenton, you will hear that there's many legislators who believe the suburbs bar so-called affordable housing. And that's why there are legislators in Trenton who believe that the court should impose more housing, regardless of infrastructure, et cetera. But that's the political, I'm, that's not a bad person who believes no. they want more affordable housing, I, but it doesn't really take into account infrastructure, roadways, uh, schools, taxes. It just doesn't. For sure. Maybe let's, uh, Sure. okay, we've exhausted that was That was a hard one. one. Well, but it's, 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 uh, it's relevant. Yeah, it's relevant, it's, it's complicated, and it's political. Maybe talk a little bit about your the new bill that you sponsored in, in uh, or at least putting out there regarding the um, pre certifications and the elimination of that uh, for insurance companies. As a physician, yeah, it's this something is my that favorite. clearly deal with on a regular basis, and a good number of my uh, staff hours goes towards getting these pre approvals. This system is a disgrace and it's horrific. How long did you train, doctor? <laughs> How long did you train? You didn't want the answer to that. Close to 10 years, college, medical school, internship, residency, right? You had to train. You then write a prescription. And then a middle manager of an insurance company has to decide whether you as a doctor should prescribe this for the patient. We have a situation in my office, a fabulous woman who is has late stage cancer. They gave her chemotherapy. She then had to wait for an approval of an MRI to de determine whether the chemotherapy worked. Look, I respect doctors and I respect the doctor-patient relationship. There are limited times, limited times where an insurance company should get involved in that relationship. Insurance companies are not the Red Cross. Okay? Insurance companies, in my judgment, have gone over the top to take away, in my judgment, the discretion of you as a doctor, and I'm sick of it. I appreciate that, some sort of relief for us. On the flip side, there's also those that believe that uh, I can have patients that come into my office and they demand tests that I know are not needed and try my hardest to convince them why it's not needed and you know darn well that they'll just go down the road to someone else who will do it. So a lot of times you rely on the insurance company to be the bad guy because you don't want to be the bad well, guy. All right, let's and, talk about, but let's and, talk about that. And then you also have the I've never uh, heard fear. that before. I've never heard that before, but that's interesting. Yeah, and then you have the the over prescribing that is part of what we've been doing many years because physicians have this 
fear that if they don't order these tests that, that somebody down the line after a bad outcome is going to sue and some attorney is going to say, why didn't you order this MRI that you probably didn't need. So a lot of testing is done unnecessarily but to protect the physician. And so um, I love the idea of the bill. The question is, you know, how do you handle some of those people sure. that have very valid reasons for ordering tests that, that might not be necessary and, yet, and the insurance company became that ability to, to say no um, where the doctor couldn't. All right, let's start with setting up a panel in the insurance company to determine what doctors are overprescribing. That's one of the issues you talked about. There are doctors who, in my judgment, do unnecessary things. They make money from the system. You set up a panel of doctors, of reasonable people, mm -hmm. you know, not insurance related, not plaintiff, personal injury lawyers, reasonable people who go like this. We're identifying that doctor as somebody who's over prescribing, an outlier. You would agree that most doctors do it properly and Absolutely. there's a small number of outliers. Identify those outliers, go after them, take their licenses away, penalize them, take away their ability to prescribe. So that gets rid of A. B is more interesting, which I've never heard before. You have a patient who wants a test, or you say, you know, I better order this test just to protect myself. In that case, a system can be set up where the patient comes to you. At that point, you can apply to the insurance. You can say, listen, I'm, not con I'm concerned about this. Set up a panel at the insurance company, and you as a doctor say, you know, I'm not sure about this one. I'm going to see whether the insurance company agrees on that, or set up a panel when in those situations. And if you don't prescribe it, there should be immunity against you as to a malpractice case. We can deal, and these are exceptions to the rule. I'm, I'm figuring 90 percent of the time you make a decision, it's right, the patient's yes, happy. Yes, and I think you so. Did those 10 percent of problems, we can fix those. Yeah, I just want to make sure that any bill comes through has a ability to factor in things that are it's outside great. of the... It's really helpful what you say, because that second part, no one's brought to my attention, and I will make sure that's in the bill. Appreciate that. So, in closing, um, Giants or Jets? I'm a Giant fan. Jets didn't exist. They were the Titans when I was growing <laughs> up. That's what happens when you're old. They, they, they weren't even a team when I was like eight years old when okay. I'm rooting for the Giants. Giants aren't doing, doing very <laughs> no, well. So I'm thinking about but you changing. still got to be honorable to your team. You know, somebody, be... somebody says very hard to change your opinion on a sports team. I don't know if you ever has met anybody go, you know, I changed my mind. I'm no longer with the Giants. I'm with the Eagles. Or as they say down in South Jersey, the Eagles. <laughs> What about uh, Yankees oh, or Yankees? Ma Yankees. The Mets, well, my son works for the Yankees. That's the right answer. What's that? My son works for the Yankees. It's a great well, answer. My best friend in law school is the president of the Yankees, Who's Randy that? Levine. Very good. So well, we went to Hofstra Law School together. And the funny part is he sent me a letter on Yankee stationery. President, must be, he's must have been there 20 years now. And I go, I think he made it up. So I did a letter, had president of the United States put my name on it. And he calls me and goes, I am the president of the Yankees. I go like this, I am the president of the United States. And eventually I realized he was the president of the Yankees. Oh, maybe he'll be president of the United States someday. They'd be both be right. That's great. Yeah. I like that. Now the big one, yeah. you know, my favorite sport, Devils or Rangers? R Rangers, once again, when you're 65 years of age, the Devils, these people didn't exist. I know, but you're a you, Jersey guy. You represent New Jersey. But you didn't, you, you can't change. You cannot change. There's certain things, and I won't tell you the rest of that joke, <laughs> but there's certain things that you cannot change. And sports teams, you, there's no way. I don't think I've ever met anybody who goes like this, you know, six months ago, I changed my favorite team. I've never heard anyone say that. And if you're out in TV land, you ever change your team, <laughs> right into the mayor, I'd like to meet you. Well, up to this year, I would have thought that'd be the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, well. See, and even there's hope. Oh, right, absolutely. Well, sir, good. I Thank appreciate you so much. the really time. Really good to see you. Thanks for your information. Thank too. you. Appreciate it. Okay.